Hello. I am uh, attempting to record Sunday school, and I'm sorry for the garb, but it's uh, cold in my house. It's early in the morning and no one's up. Uh, but I'm doing this for you guys who can't attend in person uh, Rocky Mountain Bible Church Sunday school class. So, um, yeah, we're in First Peter um, chapter 2. We're going to get through verses 4 through 10, but first I wanted to do a review of last week um, where we really were talking about this great uh, metaphor or analogy that <clears throat> Peter uses where he talks about how we are supposed to be as believers in Christ. Um, as believers in Christ, we're supposed to be like newborn babies who long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We need to grow. But uh, there was really this strong challenge to long for the pure milk of the word. Now this word, word, in Second Peter um, 2, 2 here, is logikos, is an adjective. Uh, it describes something that is well-reasoned, logical, or something that has deep spiritual intelligence and meaning. Uh, as opposed to logos, which is most often the word for word in the New Testament, um, logos occurs something like 334 times, whereas this logikos is only in this verse and in uh, uh, Romans 12.1. So usually in Greek literature, again, it just means something that's rational or reasonable. So the word of God is, is rational, it's intelligent, it's spiritual intelligence, it's deep, wise reasoning from the Lord. So <clears throat> in this illustration from 1 Peter 2, Two, the milk illustration is used to show believers how much we need the Word of God to live like a newborn baby. We need to long for it. You know, those babies, they cry out for milk because they'll die without it. It's their only sustenance. That's how our, our, uh, we should, that's kind of an imperative, a charge for us is we should long for the milk like a newborn baby. Uh, it's called the pure milk. That describes it. Uh, we need the milk of God's word to purify us. We need it to um, fill us up with good because there's so much evil in the world. Um, and we need this to, to kind of fill us up and push out all that all that rotten stuff. The word of God purifies us. And the word of God, this brilliant, intelligent word of God, is um, it's used, again, this illustration is used to show how much we need it to grow. Just like a little baby. Um who longs for the milk, mom's milk, uh, we won't grow unless we take this in daily, unless we, um, you know, get this steady diet of God's word, we're going to have stunted growth. So we really need to grow in the Lord. And the way to do it is to take in his intelligent word every day. Um, the, the brilliance of God's word is, is what will keep our minds clear and, uh, remind us of what's really important in this life and for the next. And now we see this great metaphor. So we see this great metaphor applied about how babies long for milk and how we as Christians should long for the milk of the word. Well, um, Peter really does a lot of metaphors here in this next sec section. I call them the master of metaphors. And so let's go ahead and look at this. In 1 Peter, um, we're just going to read uh, verses 4 through 10 where it says, And coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and this doom they were also and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
All right. So there's First Peter 2, 4 through 10. Um, and I really want to focus and emphasize this reality of how we come to him as uh, a living stone. This is a reference to Jesus Christ, of course, and um, how he is the, the ultimate living stone. Sorry, I don't know why I lost my notes. Here we go. All right. So first I want to ask, what is a metaphor? Well, we know I heard an old teacher, old preacher say, what's a metaphor? And he said, well, I thought that's where they put the cows. Ha ha, meadow. That's the metaphor. <laughs> Sorry. No, what was a metaphor? It is a, a picture. It's a, it's a word picture, an illustration for us from words to help us visualize um, a reality, some, some reality that uh, Peter here is trying to teach. And Peter just goes from metaphor to metaphor, even kind of mixes them all together and throws them all out there for us. Um, but the first one is he wants us to know Jesus is a living stone. Uh, he is the Lord of kindness. We saw in 1 Peter 2, 3 that we've tasted the kindness of the Lord. Um, he's the only good and gracious and kind God. Um, and that is applied to Jesus. Uh, we see this word stone as uh, used in the New Testament as describing um, <clears throat> stones throw away, uh, how far you can throw a stone. So th these stones are stones you can move. They're movable stones. They're not like a cliff or, a, you know, an a outcropping on a mountain that is firm and can't be moved. Um, they're kind of, they're, they're definitely movable. And so like um, Titus, Summer, and I, um, we went down to the river on Friday and we were Blue River and we were throwing rocks across the river and into the water and all this. And so I was just thinking about that. These are, these are stones. That's what um, the word is, is it's a movable stone. Sometimes it can be a huge movable stone, but um, in general, these aren't uh, set in place. But this isn't the type of stone that you would toss across a river, these living stones. Oh, no. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture here of a bunch of diamonds that are uncut. They look nice. Um, I think if you found them in a dirt pile, you may or may not be drawn to them because they don't have this beautiful and brilliant radiance uh, that you see with the cut diamond. There's a beautifully cut diamond that's just brilliant and reflecting all the light and all this. Um, men rejected Christ, kind of like men might re reject uncut diamonds, not knowing how valuable they are. Um, and this was like Christ in his first coming. <clears throat> I wonder what would you say is the way that Christ was ultimately rejected in his first coming? You can make the argument he was rejected in many ways. They rejected his teaching. They rejected his miracles. They rejected him just in general he's because of his family, whatever. They rejected him. But the ultimate rejection was at the crucifixion where um, he was put on a cross and he died. Uh, of course, the Jews rejected him. The Romans did the crucifixion. And um, ultimately, mankind rejected him for the most part when he was here on earth for the first time. But God shows that Jesus is precious and choice, as it says in the text, uh, with the resurrection and the ascension. So with the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, um, God shows that this was uh, his precious stone in a way because he's saying Jesus was accepted. And um, obviously his, his sacrifice was accepted and, and his work on the cross was accepted. And we know that this Jesus isn't the type of stone that you would throw away. He's, he's beautiful. And uh, scripture uses this word stone to describe the precious stones that we talked about in 1 Corinthians 3 that are the good works that we do, that we build on our salvation with. Not Again, not earning our salvation, but with that great foundation of being saved. And we um, build on that with good works. And one of those things, silver, gold, precious stones, stones, that's that word that's used there. It's a beautiful stone. It's a precious thing. And um, uh, the new Jerusalem, 
will be built with these types of costly and precious stones. And they'll just be building materials. Uh, there in Revelation 21, the same word is used. So it's a beautiful, they're beautiful stones. So this analogy pointing to Jesus, he is the beautiful, brilliant, living stone that, uh, that we need. All right. Then in verse five, it says Christians are living stones. Uh, it says that, uh, We'd be built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. So this metaphor has moved from calling Christ, this beautiful living stone, to us. And in this, we're like little copies of our Savior, our Messiah. Um, think about our lives as Christians. We live our whole lives wanting to be more Christ-like. Uh, we want to really um, put others first, and we want to... Uh, live for the glory of God and eternity and our, and our Father in heaven more than we want to live for ourselves. Um, so we're, we're brought in as this as these living stones. And again, this is uh, Peter's doing all this Old Testament. This is all built on Old Testament scriptures. We're going to dive into that. But if you think of a Gentile audience, and really that's us today, we're Gentiles, but the people who Peter was writing to in the first century they wouldn't have understood most of these things. So he's giving them these powerful metaphors, these powerful pictures to describe these spiritual realities about who we are as Christians. Um, so we know Jesus was this living stone. We know he had life in him and that he was resurrected. He's the resurrection and the life. And, and uh, so obviously he's a living stone. How can we be living stones if we're not resurrected yet? Um, I would say we're living stones when we reject, or sorry, when we radiate his brilliant light. Um, and in Acts 4, Peter, again, author of 1 Peter, he, he's, he's delivering a sermon that leads people to salvation in 3 and then in 4. Um, basically, he gets imprisoned with John, and then he has to give his defense before uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the chief priests. Um, and he uses this picture about uh, how Christ is this living stone, the stone that the builders rejected. And uh, at the end of that, he says that Jesus um, is the only way of salvation. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is that <clears throat> Jesus Christ is our living stone. And we are, are a part of that. We become living stones as well when we believe in him. And uh, that's what Peter emphasizes in Acts 4.12. There's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We're included in this, and, and because we're, we're grafted into the living stone of Christ, or we're like little living stones um, like Christ. We, God, you know, has the power to give us physical healing. God absolutely gives us spiritual life. As we're a part of Christ, and Christ is in us. And again, that resurrection, the reality of being a living stone is that we have the hope of the resurrection yet to come. So we're living stones. Um, then it says, and he starts to mix his metaphors here. He says, we're built up as a spiritual house. Um, a spiritual house. What does this mean? Uh, this is an Old Testament house. And which one would be spiritual? That's the main point of, uh, of this. So asking this question, what is this spiritual house? I think it's an allusion to the Old Testament, a house of worship, the house of God, the temple. And uh, I want to read a text from 1 Kings. This is uh, part of Solomon's prayer of dedication, uh, where he says, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you talking to God. How much less is the house that I have built? Yet have regard for the prayer of your servant and his supplication. O Lord my God, listen to the cry, listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you today. That your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have said, my name shall be there to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place here in heaven, your, your dwelling place here and forgive. So 
Solomon's emphasizing the blessing of being able to access uh, God in prayer, calling out to him, knowing that he um, has his eyes set on the temple there in Jerusalem. And so in, in that way, uh, we as Christians are included in this, which is pretty cool. Um, because he hears our prayers and his eyes are turned towards us when we turn our eyes towards him. Um, but it's pretty awesome to think about. And um, in fact, the, the temple wasn't even dis destroyed yet when Peter wrote this. And so the reality that Christianity is kind of replacing the mo mosaic practices um, is here in the text. <sighs> so we're God's house today. We're the focal point um, for God's glory on earth. God's glory resides in us as believers. That's crazy. That's crazy for, for me to think about me. Um, with all my issues, all my weaknesses, um, that's amazing grace. And I marvel at the reality of um, being God's spiritual house, being built up. It's not uh, something we do. It's something that he does in us. He builds us up as a spiritual house. Again, as we're depending on his word and um, walking with him. Crazy. The next uh, really metaphor or analogy or picture is that we're this holy priesthood. And uh, in some ways, this office has been transferred from the nation of Israel, specifically the family of Levi, uh, to us. We are believer priests. Um, that's awesome. If you think about Gentiles, we had no access to the to the temple we you know proselytes were were to the jewish faith were proselytes were even ex excluded um, in many ways so um but we're like in the priesthood now as believer priests so um as priests what are the spiritual sacrifices that we would offer up to god through christ um one would be our very selves. Uh, you see this in a text like Romans 12.1. Um, you also see it, uh, the reality of what we can do as believer priests um, in Hebrews 13. Um, through Jesus then, this is Hebrews 13.15, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of of lips that give thanks to his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices god is pleased stop it sorry it's my obnoxious docs so we praise god and we can do good we can share and god is definitely pleased with those sacrifices and then we also romans 12 1 offers ourselves as living sacrifices holy and holy and acceptable to god Okay, moving quickly here. Now, Peter had all of this in mind when he um, first mentions Christ as a living stone. And so he quotes uh, from Isaiah 28. And I wanted to go put this in the context of Isaiah 28 really quick. Um, but he says, I'll just read it from Isaiah 28, where he says, Behold, well, wait, I have to read a little more. Okay. 28, 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, and talking to the leaders of the Jews. Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, this is what Peter quotes, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. It will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow the secret place. Your covenant with death will be canceled and your pact with shield will not stand. I love that. So 
in this um, picture here, what we see is that um, there's this evil in Israel. They're hiding in lies. They're deception. The leaders are, are depending on deception. God calls them out for it. And he says, instead of that, I'm going to lay this chief stone, this chief cornerstone in Israel. And um, those who believe in it will not be disappointed. This is a reference to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. And um, it's just really cool because in all of this, um, this is our support for being grafted in to the priesthood. This is our support for being included um, in the temple worship and, and the priestly activities. Um, so Peter bases it all in scripture. So the question is, do we feel like this today? Do we feel like living precious stones radiating the light and glory of God? Uh, sorry, dogs are obnoxious. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we feel like that. Scripture says that's who we are, no matter how we feel. We, uh, we don't earn our way to be like this or work our way to be like this. Um, but it is possible for us to, to be like this as Christians. Um, remember, he who believes in Christ will not be disappointed. He who believes in the living stone becomes a living stone himself. Um, so being a precious and living stone is not disappointing. Being able to radiate God, radiate his glory, uh, what a blessing that is. And as the sun's coming up right now, um, I'm getting brighter and brighter, I'm sure, in your screens. But um, that's just a picture of what we're to do as believers is um, radiate his glory like this like this beautiful diamond would, um, the sun's light. Uh, being a part of God's house also, as, as believers, we're not disappointed when we think about the reality of being a part of God's house. Um, that representation of him on earth, the, the living temple, um, this this thing that's being built up and growing together, um, all of us connected to one another is a spiritual building, um, edifying, growing, building. It's a really cool picture, and um, it's definitely not a disappointing part of that. And then lastly, as living stones, we're, we're part of this priesthood. And being believer priests, what an honor that is, that we get to call out to God, that we get direct access to his throne. So cool. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Lord, I just pray for everyone who hears this to really celebrate the realities of being living stones, of being the temple of God, and of being a part of the holy priesthood. Um, help us as believers to truly grow up in these things as we long for your the milk of your word, as we cling to you. Um, help these to be realities in us. Um, and uh, I don't think we earn these or necessarily work toward these, but um, they are realities of who we are in Christ, whether we feel like it or not. So help us to believe that today, believe that uh, whenever we hear this message, and be reminded of it beyond, beyond that. Be reminded of what Peter teaches us in First Peter chapter 2. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Grace and peace in Christ alone.